Bluestone makes investment loans simple with competitive interest rates. Borrow up to 85% of the value of your investment property without paying lender's mortgage insurance and no cap on existing investment portfolio size, plus personal Bluestone support from application to settlement. So don't wait to unlock your future. Bluestone, award-winning home loan solutions. Find out more at bluestone.com.au slash investors. Lending criteria, T's and C's and fees apply. Credit provided by Permanent Custodians Limited Australian Credit Licence 390183. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Oh, good day. How are you going? Phil Tarrant here, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Hope you're well. Hope you're enjoying uh, being a property investor in what is uh, one of the most interesting markets I've seen. I'm sort of fortunate now. I've been investing for for a decade or coming up to a decade at least. So I could claim now that I've been in the cycle. I've been in the market for at least one cycle. But I'm very fortunate to uh, have quite a significant network of people within Property Investment Australia who have seen many market cycles. And it's my job as the host of the Smart Property Investment Show is to navigate and curate conversations with people that know what they're doing, that do this for a living. A lot of the demand I get from a lot of the feedback from our listeners, and you guys write to us, head through at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, is to get people onto the show who actually have an appreciation for what it looks like to see several market cycles and a deep appreciation and understanding of all the different markets right across Australia. Two of them are in the studio with me today, backed by popular demand, regulars on the Smart Property Investment Show, Cam McClellan and Matthew Lewis, and they're both directors at OpenCorp. One's in Brisbane, one's in lockdown in Melbourne. Gentlemen, how are you going? You well? Yeah, not bad, mate. Not bad. Looking forward to the end of this lockdown, I tell you. But uh, we're used to it in Victoria. We're tough breed down here. (laughs) <laughs> How's um and I try not to get too political on the show, uh, Cam, but um yeah. thoughts and, and attitudes towards your premier, is he still loathed or is he sort of the being a savior of COVID? Oh, I'm unsure, mate. They're, oh look, I was surprised at some of the decisions he made earlier on. I actually agreed with some of the harder lockdowns. Uh, there's some ridiculous policy. You can unpick any political party and have a crack at him. I don't like politics overall. Do you know what I mean? I don't trust any party. But uh is he low? There's some pretty, uh, there's some speculative rumours going around at the moment. I don't know about whether this fall was really a fall or whether he got knocked <laughs> out from doing something untoward, but hey, uh, that'll all come out in the wash, I'm sure. It will do. And, um, you know, politics does have some application towards the performance of property markets. And I doubt yeah. we're going to have a federal yeah. election this year. I think it's going to be sort of, I'm going to call it so April, May of next year. Cam, what's your thoughts as we gear up for an election? You're going to see different parties coming out saying different things. As a property investor, how do you stay the course and not get too obsessed by any outcomes of a federal election to uh, 2022? Yeah, I don't think there'd be anything dramatic like there was last federal election when they were talking about the removal of negative gearing. I think that um, ship has sailed. That was the unlosable election, and that was one of the main policies, one of those main policies that uh, I think Australians kick back on. So what are they keen to do this election? They're keen to crank the economy and to be shown going into the election, the current party is the economy is cranking and they're doing all the right things. So it's going to be definitely about that we talk about reducing the the deficit, but at the detriment of getting the economy going. And I think it's more important to get the economy going than it is to uh, to be focused on you know reducing the debt at this point in time. So I think it'd be pretty aggressive. Louis, yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, economically, the government would have to be thinking they've kicked a few goals. And I guess those of us in the Australian community who are focused on, on economy would probably be saying, well, that's a bit of a tick. So if I can't imagine Labor's going to attack them on economic grounds or financial grounds. They're going to want to demonstrate they're a safe pair of hands as well. So if anything, they're going to be uh, battling it out over some of the social things, which like, I guess, equality in the workforce and uh, perhaps some of the environmental aspects and global warming, that sort of thing. Well, we'll have some fun. We'll have some fun navigating this, no doubt, over this period running up to elections. And we'll, we'll get into it, just what it means for property investors. But you're talking about sort of getting the economy cranking, Cam, and a big focus for the government right now, even state-based governments, um, some of them are Labor, some of them Liberal, but at a, a federal government level. We saw it in the budget that came out in May. It's all towards jobs and jobs growth and driving towards a lower unemployment rate. And what is clear, particularly from directors out of the Reserve Bank of Australia, is that they're quite happy to let property have the run that it's, it's having right now. They're not really getting involved, Cam, trying to manipulate or slow the market down in any means. So, 
what that means is that markets right across Australia are firing and everyone's benefiting from this huge upswing in property. And I guess the big question that I really want to get into today is trying to get some sense of that market, both from a the narrative around it, but uh, we'll lean on Matt to go behind the numbers. Where are we, Cam? Let's kick it off with this. Where are we with this current upswing? Is it relatively new? Are we halfway through this upswing or towards the tail end of the upswing? Can you give me some sense where we are in the cycle? Yeah, happy to get into it. And it is surprising, as we are talking before, usually capital cities move at different paces at different points in time. So they're at different points in the growth cycles. It's, uh, it's very interesting at this point in time, having been investing for over 20 years now and some of our board members investing for 50 years. So we're pretty in tune with looking back through history and looking at where different capital city markets move. And I think this is the first time that I've seen, even looking back through charting, that all the capital cities are cranking at this point in time, all the major capital cities, where they are, and that's what we're keen to get into, where they are at those points in cycles and how people can predict the future as safe as possible as investors is what I think we want to try and unravel as much as possible today. So we need to look at supply, demand, affordability, and we need to talk about the type of buyers that are in the market. So the first home buyers, upgraders, downgraders, and investors, and where they are at different points in time, where they are in the current city markets. But it's got some legs left in it, just to answer it directly. The uh, mm. the markets started off, um, first home buyers are active through the different grants that are going around, even Sydney uh, New South Wales released another grant for I saw over the weekend for first home buyers. So they're still trying to invigorate the market further with getting first home buyers into the market. But the investors haven't really kicked in at this point in time. They're the ones that really drive that uh, tail end of the market. So we've got some upside. Yeah, and I was only reading a report over the weekend that's starting to show that investors are now moving to the market as some of the affordability for first home buyers starts to wane uh, and it's a challenge to get into the market. But from a baseline philosophical point of view for you, Cam, and the advice and the support you're giving to your clients, have you missed the boat? If you haven't been in the market for the last three to four months or last six months and got this uplift that we've all seen in markets right across the nation, are you too late or now's the right time to get into property? I'll answer it even further. So yes, we're advising clients to get into the market, but I put my money where my mouth is. I purchased another property last week for my kids and put it in a trust for them. So I put one property in a trust for the four kids. So I've got individual trust set up for them but I'm still buying property currently for my kids and putting it in trust. So I've set up a a trust for them. We're going through the numbers. So I've made it a real educational approach to this property that I've purchased for them. So having them missed the boat, if I'm buying properties for my kids, then you'd have to say, no, I'm I'm banking on some upside. (laughs) And I think that's right. And a lot of people are so obsessed now, and I see it with with people checking out smartproductinvestment.com or listening to this podcast where they feel as though they've left it too long to enter the market or they're so fatigued by some of the challenges of buying in this particular market that they've just gone too much for me. I'm done. I, I, I'm done with auctions. I'm yeah. done with going to open houses with 50 other people there. I have no visibility over the numbers. Stuff's going for whatever percent over what the the asking price is. I'm just going to wait it out and uh, wait for the cycle to change. Is that from a philosophical point of view, is that the people who never really benefit from investing in property can? It's tough, isn't it? Because a lot of people, and if we talk, and Matt and I developed a, which we won't talk diagrams today, but um, a concept called the developer's activity chain, which really talks about supply and demand. So people can really identify when is the danger time when you shouldn't invest in property. So I think going through that, knowing that first time investors sometimes get into the market when they've seen property prices move a bit, then they've seen about a year of good news stories in the papers and those sort of things. So they've got their consumer confidence up. That two to three year window when the market's really cranking and people will get in at the back end of that because they've seen prices go for about 12 months. They've seen really good news media stories for about 12 months. But the trouble is with that is for developers to deliver large amounts of stock to the market usually takes two to three years, sometimes four years, depending on whether it's apartments or whether it's large scale land subdivisions. So first time investors are usually getting into the market when the majority of investors or developers are dropping their stock onto the market or bringing stock to market. So for some investors, their first taste of property investment is buying right at the top of the market, which is what we call a danger time. So when we talk to our clients normally, when it's a stupidly heated market and we're about to see that developer stock come onto the market, maybe look to another capital city. So that's the challenge at the moment. All the capital cities are cranking at this point in time. So most people get into the market, they've seen 50% growth, they buy something and it has a normal price correction of 10%. And that's their first taste of property investment. Mm. 
um, which is unfortunately a negative for some people, which is why some people only get one. Yeah, I was going to say that exactly. That's the reason why most people only buy one or two properties because the first yeah. property they buy is the wrong property. And for you, Matt, yeah. and I want to get a sense for what we're talking about here is these developer stock coming on market now. I was reading a piece on smartproperinvestment.com.au the other day, and it's saying there's 42,000 properties less in Sydney than what they need for the current population, let alone for when the markets open up and Australia opens up and we start getting migration coming in. So yep. can we get back to like a 101 level around this understanding? I know COVID has is, is thrown some very different scenarios into the mix in terms of right now, you might want to develop a place, but you can't even get materials for it right off the boat because yeah. it's all locked up. So can you give me yep. some sense for the cycle as it sits right now from a development point of view? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because and I think probably it's really important for people to understand that there's two different, I guess, terms in relation to supply. There's structural supply and then there's short-term supply. So in terms of short-term supply on the market, if half the people in your suburb who own houses decide to sell and they're taking their properties to auction, for instance, there's an oversupply potentially in that suburb for a very short period of time, an oversupply of houses hitting the market. That doesn't mean that there's an oversupply of houses in the state or in the city because you're essentially just moving one person out of a house and another person is going to move in. The person who moves out is going to have to go and live somewhere else. So you're not changing the, the structural supply of dwellings in that market. Development changes the structural supply in the market. So when there's an undersupply of houses and like a structural undersupply, meaning that the demand for new houses exceeds the market's ability to create, then that's obviously where there's a lot of pressure from the bottom end. So we call it a a bottom-up cycle in that situation. If you go to Iraq or Mosman and there's almost no properties on the market or one person sells a house this year, that's going to mean there's a heap of people trying to get into that one house and it will pull the price up from the top. So that's a top-down market dynamic. So let's talk development though. So that's the bottom-up. So if there's an undersupply of development stock in the market, then there's more people at that bottom end of the market trying to get in and it's pushing prices up. So what do we see in the bottom-up cycle? It's typically predicated on there's low vacancy rates, meaning that there's an undersupply of rental accommodation. And because of that low vacancy rate, it often means that rents are going up. First home buyers are exiting the market or exiting the rental pool, trying to get into the housing market and buy. So they normally have to build or buy an apartment, that sort of thing. So if you think about it that way, and right now we're talking, there's 12 months. If you turn up today to buy a block of land, you're probably looking at 12 months before you get to settle on that block of land. And that doesn't mean you can move into that house or a house yet. You've just got a piece of dirt that you then need to build a house on. And then typically it's probably five to six months to build your house. And right now it's probably more like seven to eight months to build a house because you can't get timber, you can't get roof tiles, you can't get brick layers, you can't get the waffle pods that go under the slabs. So pretty much whole the whole supply chain is stretched. So that's going to keep pushing further out. So that means we're really talking 18 months to two years to see a really big structural shift in supply from buying decisions made today. So if I kind of back up a few steps though, Home Builder was announced last June. First homes from Home Builder are starting to come through the pipeline now and will probably be reaching conclusion pretty soon. So for the next six months, we'll start to see an increase in the amount of dwellings hitting the ground for people to actually move into. So that's going to help to balance things a little bit at that bottom end of the market. But there are still certain markets that are very undersupplied. And when I say very, I mean, we're talking one, one and a half percent vacancy rates against the balanced market of 3%. And that's going to take like a sustained effort to overcome that. And it's not every part of every capital city, but there are pockets in every capital city that are experiencing that type of kind of low vacancy rate and there are some cities where the whole city, like Perth, for instance, the whole city is at a 1% vacancy rate. Brisbane is at 1.5 or 1.4 now. Adelaide's the same, Hobart. Uh, whereas Sydney and Melbourne, it's a bit more patchy where there are segments of the market that are, I guess, tight and other segments like the western suburbs of Melbourne, vacancy rates over still getting price growth because of the low, low interest rates. But there's no structural undersupply there. You would almost say it's a structural oversupply in that market. Yeah, and all the different markets are moving at different speeds, and we'll break that down a little mm. bit later in the podcast. But, Cam, you, you made a good point. It's my initial couple of remarks. You know, I've been investing now for, for nearing 10 years. You've been in the game for 
for 20 years and you've got people as part of your organization that have been at it for, for five decades, right? So you've either seen it yourselves or you can tap into people that you have done. How are you sort of yourself viewing this current market? And this is from a, you know, capitalizing on on the upswing. Um, it's very different to every other market we've operated within. So therefore, is it stable or is it really highly unstable? Because there's so many different factors we only spoke about there around you know, just accessing building material, we really haven't had those challenges before. So this volatility, is this when property investors will do well if they're able to read the tea leaves and actually understand how to navigate it? Yeah, well, as, as Matt said, the volatility is in favour of the property investor at this point in time or the property market. So all of those things being under supply of building materials only puts the supply further out. So there's more pressure on that. I think the key if people are looking and trying to reduce risk when it comes to investing, if you look at some of those vacancy rate areas, like Matt said, with the western side of Melbourne, if you've got a 4% vacancy rate, but the prices are still going up, you know that it's only because the rest of the Melbourne's pushing it up. Whereas other areas of Melbourne, if I'm using that as an example, you've got in the 1% to 2% vacancy rate bracket. So you know there's a fundamental undersupply, let alone land subdivisions in the, you know, if you've got established areas that land subdivisions, are, you've got 12 month settlements on there, you know, developers can't bring the stock fast enough to market. So as you see each land estate getting released, you're seeing twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 getting put on of each, each new established lot going up. So if you want to get into the market now, you know that you're buying, you've got land estates that are going to be worth more down the track and you know the building costs, if you can lock a builder in today's prices, you know the building costs are going up. We're talking to builders daily and even builders a couple of weeks ago saying we're putting our build price up 10 grand and now coming back going, we're not even sure that's enough. So they're trying to guesstimate out and go, what's building supply material going to be worth? So if you can lock in land now at the right price or if you're buying, and I, I love buying new and building because they have fantastic depreciation and that helps my holding costs for the first couple of years. I get good tenant appeal, low maintenance. So I've got many established homes in the past, but I've, for the last 15 years, I've only bought and built new because I get all those benefits. So I think if you can lock in land at today's prices and lock in a build contract at today's prices in an area where it's got a low vacancy rate, you can do very well. So this whole idea about how do you capitalise in this market and whether you capitalise into it and you know a whole bunch of people aren't doing anything right now. I want to get into that. We'll just go to break beforehand. Stay with us back in a moment. Whether you're a seasoned property investor or about to buy your first property, finding the right investment property to buy in 2021 isn't easy. Why do it alone when you could partner with award-winning buyer's agent, Paul Glossop? Over the last 10 years, Paul has helped hundreds of clients build multi-property portfolios. Paul's secret is finding off-market bargains that get snapped up before the general public even gets a sniff. Interested? Head to purepropertyinvestment.com today to schedule a strategy call with Paul Glossop. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm with Cam McClellan and Matthew Lewison, directors at OpenCorp. Now, Cam, the big question is, if you're waiting for something to change in this market, are you going to be waiting forever and you will never be buying? How do you sort of break that sort of philosophical mental perceptions of some people to wait, wait, wait until market conditions are absolutely perfect before you take action or just get involved now? How do you work with that? Yeah, it's amazing. I think 20 years ago when I first started investing and I was asking Steve, who's a, one of the board members, who's the, he's been investing for 50 years, Matt's old man actually, and I said the same thing to him. The Melbourne market in the late 90s, early 2000s gone crazy. Is that it? Is it cooked now if I missed the boat? And he said, well, if you've got affordable money, which is it's a much more affordable now, and the supply and demand equation is in the favour of more demand than supply, then you're going to do better off over the long term. Could I afford to hold property at that point in time? Yes, I could. Can I afford it to hold property now? It's much easier to afford to buy and hold property now than it was back then. And we've got a much more drastic undersupply of affordable housing in Australia than we did back then. So if you look at those three factors, supply, demand, and affordability, people haven't missed the market at this point in time. So supply, demand, and affordability. So I guess the thesis of there's still a lot left in this particular market, just this whole logic rhetoric around the lack of supply of housing and the ongoing need for housing moving forward, which is going to be intersected between cheap money, more people buying, really low vacancy rates, and then also potentially migration coming back here in Australia. That's where the the major upswing is going to come from, your view, Cam, moving forward? 
Uh, I think the major upswing, and Matt can probably talk, um, he can nerd it up with some uh, numbers because um, while people can make general statements and say everything's going to be fine, what Matt and his team do well is just dig into, he's got a team of data scientists and analysts that dig into the numbers and present it to him in a way that he can comprehend it. And then he presents that back to the board and our investment committee to the market's good or not. So there's a bit more method than madness and just going property will be good forever. But yeah, at the, at the moment, at this point in time, the data that I rely on comes from Louis' team. Matt, you, if uh, well, yeah. let's get into it. I really wanted to go around yeah. the grounds because um, there's look, all of Australia's been performing quite well already. You're starting to see different speeds in the pace of growth and different asset classes which are performing better than others. So, if you're happy, Matt, to sort of nerd it up with us, and, <laughs> and this is what a lot of our our listeners like. Nerd being a, a term of endearment, obviously. Um, if you exactly. don't mind going around going Another around a nation, man, we, we can kick off in your neck of the woods, mate. Sunny Brizzy. Or Queensland. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've, I've just purchased up here and it was a very, very tight market to buy in. And in fact, I was looking at buying, it's relocated from Melbourne, but we were looking at moving at the start of 2020 and put it on hold because of COVID. And in the space of that year, the price to enter the market, at least in the areas I was looking, which is kind of inner city Brisbane, went up about 40%. And that wasn't for, I guess, Let's say it wasn't the total end price, but the price to buy in for something that you intend to renovate or build on fresh went up 40% now because the construction costs are going up. So as Kim said, if the inputs are going up, input costs, then the replacement cost will be going up as well. So that's a huge shift in one year, especially considering most of that year was through a, a pandemic. So market's very tight. Rental market is extremely tight as well. So rents have been going up in double digit growth pretty much for the last six months now at an annualised rate that would be over 15% uh, if it continues to run at the same place. So again, it's kind of seeing, we're seeing lots of people starting to see more urgency to get out of that rental market and move into the, to being homeowners, but there's not much supply, very hard to get your hand on land. So we're seeing really strong price growth there, albeit that when you look at the, the total price growth across Brisbane in the last 12 months, it's still below Sydney, for instance, but the fundamentals of Brisbane are absolutely spot on for continued and sustained growth. And that's before we open the doors for obviously a lot of a lot of people moving from overseas or even holiday makers coming back here. And we know that Queensland has um, really been a beneficiary of that holiday spend in the past. Uh, so yeah, I think when those borders open, it's going to be extremely, I guess, tight in that rental market to levels we've seen before. And what's the government's attitude up there in relation to making more land available for the purpose of, of housing? Uh, I don't want to get political again, but... Um, no, it's a, yeah. it's a ripper question. So Brisbane City Council has the most residents of any city council in Australia. So obviously it's a metropolitan area and you would think it'd, they'd be all for density. And they certainly are in a few different areas, but they've really promoted high-rise development. And there's not much high-rise development coming out of the ground right now. But about 18 months ago... They introduced a new policy to refuse any development application for townhouse development in a residential suburb. So unless it's already zoned for medium to high density, they won't approve townhouse development. So they've really just cut out a lot of townhouse development. As a result, we've seen about 15% price growth in townhouse developments already in the Brisbane City Council area in the last 12 months. So, yeah, obviously they're just strangling the supply the metropolitan area and obviously in the fringe markets where you might get land the infill markets are really drying up very quickly and as a result again we've seen 20 percent plus price growth in land markets yeah and now obviously we're seeing construction cost increases as well so that replacement cost is lifted and that's also driving up the uh, established housing market or resale market yeah, so um, good point you made there about infill and, and Cam. Question for you: What sort of stuff do you, you said you like sort of house of land new type of build? Is this more green fields out in the out in the sticks, or you like the infill stuff? No, I've always been a big believer of infill, so areas that are surrounded by established housing. So if I go back fifteen years when I started working up the methodology of investing, what Matt and I worked through was basically if we had a specific area, we drew a line towards the CBD because back then everyone just wanted to live close to the CBD. So if there was large amounts of land that were able to be brought to market between the area when we're looking in the CBD, then that could dampen price growth until that land was absorbed. 
Times have changed now, so we now need to do that process to every one of what they call in Melbourne activity centres. They're slightly different names in each of the. So they're trying to create small business hubs or economic areas outside of the CBD because the government doesn't have enough money to put the infrastructure in to have that many people travelling and working in the CBD. So they're trying to keep more people living and working in the local area. So to answer your question, are we like infill areas that have limited supply but still have, you know, it might be a few hundred house lots that you can bring to market. Once they're gone, they're gone. Saying that if you're at the point in your investment career, which might be the start of it, and you can't afford to buy in some of those areas, because some of those areas are pretty affluent. If you can't get into those areas, then you need to look at the next best thing. So you're better to be in the market at all than not be in it and miss out on the growth because you can't get into the premium lot. So now that we've got that option there to look at some of the areas that for the next five to seven years might be deemed on the outskirts of cities, if the planning in those areas is satisfies our acquisition team and it meets the criteria for someone who just hasn't got enough money to get into the really good area, well, that might be a second good second option for them to get into the market, but still be in an area that's going to be built out in the coming you know, four or five years, for example. And just one one more thing in terms of land supply. I mean, every capital city has, a, let's call it an urban growth boundary. Again, they've all got different yeah. names. And the state governments have been so reluctant to move that for the last decade. It's obviously that maybe there's political constraints on it, but there's certainly not much willpower from them to see an increase in supply, even though they make announcements. We've just rezoned 20,000 homes. It was decisions made a decade ago. They're just taking credit for now. There's financial restraints, isn't there? They can't afford to push the boundary any further because they can't afford the infrastructure to take people. Absolutely. There's a, a fair bit of that. So, um, so yeah, so obviously in Brisbane, there's supply or there's been housing stock brought to market for the last decade, but they haven't been pushing out the boundary. So it's just creating more and more constraint. On yeah, and and to, to that, the process uh, you just explained there, Cam, I imagine COVID is probably a big enabler for that because you talk about these sort of metropolitan centres. You see the same in Sydney here, for example, you know, your Penrith or your Liverpools or whatever it is where you can still buy within five kilometres of the CBD in areas which is either infill or it's new release type property. The same logic applies. And COVID has probably supported that quite a lot in terms of sort of underpinning ongoing price growth in those areas. Yeah, one thing that's probably is this probably the scary thing for investors when I hear some of the tree change type scenarios and you see some of our regional cities that are only just scrape inner cities. And if you use, you know, Victoria, you know, your Bendigos, Ballarats, people are, are really talking up the growth in those smaller cities. My issue is they don't have the urban growth boundaries. So if you've got a undersupply of 5% in those markets, well, the builders can quite easily develop and build another 10 or 15% on top of that to catch up. And so there might be some short-term price growth. So my advice is don't make the investment choice to invest in those sort of regional cities based on long-term price growth. If you're doing it for your own personal tree change, go nuts if you want to live out there, but be very wary buying in regional. And I'm a country boy, so I can say this. I love the country towns and love the lifestyle, but the one thing that uh, country towns have got lots of is land. And if you've got a large amount of land, then that dampens supply um, pressure. Yeah, so um, well put, uh, Cam. Uh, Matt, so that's busy. Give us a sense of uh, Sydney, mate. What's your sort of view is my neck of the woods? I guess we're, we're all representing the whole East Coast here. Yeah. yeah, okay. So obviously, I mean, Sydney has got some pockets that have got much tighter vacancy rates, but those pockets are generally the really established residential markets, lower North Shore, eastern suburbs, that sort of thing. Again, Sydney's had the highest price growth in the capital city markets in the last 12 months. So obviously there's there's plenty to support the market at the moment. But and sorry, I should also point out, I mean, Sydney typically will run a larger vacancy rate than Melbourne or the other cities. So it often sits between two and a half, three percent. And that's not a detriment to the market. It can kind of sustain that. Mm. But for instance, I was out in Marsden area, Colby, out in the northern or western suburbs of Sydney last week and there's some beautiful developments coming through there but the vacancy rate's sort of sitting up over five percent at the moment which is kind of indicating that there perhaps is a bit of an oversupply of at least of rental stock in that market and we're not rental growth in sydney at the moment that we're seeing elsewhere yeah so i guess again it comes down to the pockets of, of sydney but 
the pace of development, again, we're seeing that sort of developable land supply being absorbed really, really quickly. And if let's assume borders open in the next 12 months and we'll probably, I mean, my gut feel is that we'll see a, a faster rate of immigration than what we've seen in the past for financial reasons. The government wants to grow the economy really quickly, help to absorb some of the debt, increase the taxpayer base, as well as some of the demographic changes that have been happening. And before the show, we're talking about the intergenerational report that comes out on the 28th of June. And the expectation is that that's going to show up that the closed borders has actually been detrimental to the demography of Australia and it's going to create a bit of a hole if we don't address that. So so we're expecting that that's going to be lead to an influx of people moving to Australia and who wouldn't want to, and they often land in Sydney. So that's going to see, I think, when that happens, we're going to start to see that absorption of some of that excess rental stock in the market because they don't move here and buy straight away. They move yeah. in and they move into that those rental markets. And that rental market, I mean, you're talking about the northwest corridor, I guess, of, of Sydney mm-hmm. there. Um, is there a big disconnect between houses and, and units out that way? So I, I didn't really look too closely at the units in, mm-hmm. in that market. But obviously, when you move back in closer to some of the activity centres in out in the west, then you do find there, there is a big build-up of kind of low-rise apartments and there's a bit of excess stock there but it's not as much as in the cbd of sydney Mm. Uh, albeit that i don't have the exact figures in front of me right now but i mean vacancy rates during covid in sydney cbd blew up into the teens as they did in melbourne and they've been coming back really sharply so what we've generally been observing is that rents dropped in the cbd in those higher density areas of most capital cities as a result of the higher vacancy rates because rents dropped and now people are a bit more comfortable with COVID, they're shifting back in there, taking advantage of those lower rents and moving out of some of the other high density um, markets where the amenity might not be quite as good as the CBD. Nice. Um, well, let's go to Melbourne and get a sense of what's happening there. We'll just go to another break back in a moment. A low interest rates impacting on your investment returns? It's time to rethink. Rethink Investing creates wealth for clients through the strategic purchase of positively geared, high cash flow commercial property. Industrial properties, retail assets or office spaces can be a smart investment option that produces significant and long-term return on investment. Rethink your investment options and look to commercial property. Learn more at rethinkinvesting.com.au. Rethink Investing, Australia's number one commercial buyer's agency. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with Clem McClellan and Matthew Lewis, and the directors at Open Corp. Now, Melbourne, but it's not lockdown. Markets seem to do pretty well. Um, you know, it's been stop, start, stop, start. I don't know what impact that's had, Matt, but um, can you give me some sense for what you're seeing down in, in Melbourne? Yeah. So, I mean, the vacancy rate across Melbourne is higher than we've seen for quite a while, but it's coming down fairly quickly. So it hit close to 5% during. I guess the depths of Melbourne's lockdown last year. So just kind of moving into the third quarter, it's back down to 3.7%. Now, just to put that in perspective, that's about double where it was before COVID. It was sitting about 1.9% at the start of 2020. So what does that mean? There's obviously a lot more vacancies. And let's call it, there's now 23,000 instead of sort of 11 and a half, 12,000 vacancies. But those vacancies aren't all in evenly spread across the city. So if you look out in the western suburbs, you're going to see vacancy rates that are up over 4%. But if you look in the, I guess, southeastern suburbs, then that vacancy rate's actually down at 1.2%. So it's a really a tale, like even across Melbourne, it's such starkly contrasting markets in supply. And it Pretty much if you were to swing around the clock, you're going a clockwise direction from the, the western suburbs around the north all the way to the southeast, the vacancy rate pretty much goes down as you go. So it gets down to 1.2. Obviously, it's up over four in the west and it's just under four in the north. So we typically found that the markets that have absorbed a lot more of the international migration in the last few years, pre-COVID, have got higher vacancy rates now. So that's obviously something that is likely to reverse when the borders open and we start to see people moving back in from overseas, albeit there's a fair bit of stock for that to absorb. Now, prices are still going up in those markets because of obviously improved affordability, but certainly the markets with low vacancy rates, like in the eastern suburbs and southeast, they're the markets that are seeing the strongest price growth plus rents going up 
And as rents go up, it has a double whammy effect because it helps to push first home buyers out of the rental market, encouraging them to go and buy their own place, especially when interest rates are low. More first home buyers moving into that new home buyer market is going to push up prices. But it also encourages investors into the market because if an investor is seeing that the yields are improving, then they're more likely to go into that market, which again increases that, that demand. So you're kind of seeing first home buyers being more active as well as investors in those tight vacancy rate markets. And some really good facts and information there, Matt. I guess that the question for you, Cam, is you know, these are short-term market fluctuations. These are nuances which may shape where you buy and your timing for, for buying and, and what you do buy. But this sort of sense of why you invest in property, and, and most people I, I know sort of invest in property to try and create some wealth. So you need to hold the property for quite some time. So how do you sort of balance these short-term market fluctuations with this base theory behind sort of buying and holding property for long-term growth? On that basis, you know, we're talking about people sitting on their hands waiting to get through this upswing to time the, the position of market, but property markets always move on. So if you're not in there, you're not holding for property long-term, you're not really going to see any of the benefits from it. Yeah, I've always um, looked at, I mean, we know based on the government stats that we've got a long-term undersupply of property in Australia. So while money's affordable for the next decade, which is what they're forecasting, then we're going to have some good long-term growth. If So if I think about my investment journey, most people go through what we call the acquisition phase, then the consolidation phase, and then sort of a transition to retirement. I'm past the acquisition phase, my own personal portfolio. So I'm sitting there going, well, I know I'll get income for the next X amount of years. And after that, I'll transition out of potentially some of my portfolio and look at exiting out of that and transitioning into a more higher income type strategy. The investments that I'm making now, which is more poignant to people that might be listening here as investors who are in that acquisition phase, whether it's their first property or their third property, really, it's very similar to what I'm doing for my kids now. So I know that my kids probably in 10, 15 years, depending on, I've got four kids at different ages, won't be able to afford or be very tough to get into the property market. The deposits are going to be huge. So I'm trying to get a property for them now to sit alongside so they can watch the growth of that property and together collectively make the decision to duplicate that property. Obviously, I'm guarantor on this thing. So they're getting somewhat of a free ride, but I'd rather do that and teach them about investing Knowing that I've got confidence the property is, as you come back to you asked whether it's for the long term, knowing the prices are going to be more expensive in 10 or 15 years when my kids are buying, I want to give them the leg up and probably enough that they can get started. But but if they can get into their market individually, buy that one property now, in a couple of years' time when the growth comes in, duplicate it. In 10 years, they might have two in there. They can then collectively sell the property or draw some equity out to go and buy their individual property. So People haven't missed the mark by no means. And if it comes back to the core, like if you've got the time and the know-how and the real depth of understanding to absorb some of the information that Matt and his team have got, fantastic. You know, more power to you. Your knowledge is power, as we say. But if you don't, go on the broader fundamentals. The properties are going to be worth more in 10, 15 years than they are today. And with leverage, it's one of the best investments you can get. So I'm still uh, a big believer in property for the long term, enough so that I'm putting my kids in it, Phil. So hopefully that gives a bit of insight. And fair enough. And, and for a lot of people, they might not be aware of it in a long-term wealth creation and, and a transition to retirement. I think, I can't remember the numbers, but most Australians uh, need to lean on the government for a pension than those that don't. So, you know, as a property investor, you, you're doing your civic good, as in you're not going to be leaning on the government coffers to support your retirement. But a lot of Australians probably have got, through this cycle at least, a whole bunch of money in their, um, an equity in their their family home. Your thoughts towards potentially leveraging that for uh, wealth creation through property investment in this market? Yeah, we track the amount of people that contact Open Corp and and look at the, the basically the amount of people that qualify to buy a specific um, price band of property. And I don't think in the last, you know, it's nearly 20 years, uh, 15 year plus years that Open Corp's been around, there's no point in time where people are able to get money more readily now than they have before. Because you're right, the affordability is fantastic, the interest rates are low, and people have got huge amounts of equity. If they've owned a property for the last five years themselves, they're very surprised when we go and get a valuation done on their property, how much money they've got to be able to duplicate. So we've got people at this point in time buying multiple properties straight away getting into the market. Normally it might be one property that they're buying and then we wait for the equity growth on that and they go again. At the moment, you know, some people are buying three, four, five properties immediately, which is uh, it's, it's good times for those that can afford it, but it comes obviously down to income and equity or, or cash in the bank. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and also a bit of a, a mindset shift to proactive take control of your financial future through investing in property. And Matt, we've done the sort of um, the East Coast. To be remiss of us not to look over on the West Coast and Perth, which seems to be doing something now after what has been a pretty lacklustre decade. Um, can you give me some sense for the market out there, mate? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that the vacancy rate is sitting around 1%. So it's an incredibly tight vac- rental market in Perth at the moment. And if we look at asking rents across the whole city, I mean, rents have gone up 16% for houses in the last 12 months. So you can kind of see as people have come off the moratorium on rental increases, rents are going up just incredible amounts. So that's got a fair bit to run considering the vacancy rate is so low and it'll probably take another year to start to lift that vacancy rate up as more supply comes to the market. But probably the one thing that Perth is that the house price growth is just starting to pick up as well. So obviously we had a bit of a a rough run in Perth between 2014 and kind of 2020. The market was ready to to start taking off in Perth and it's just started to see that in the last kind of six months. We're starting to see the price growth. But fundamentally, it should be going up for for a while to go, for a while to come. So yeah, we think the, the signs are good for that Perth market. Nice one. Well, we've covered a lot of info, guys, over the podcast. Thanks thanks for your time. Um, if people want to know more, Cam, about these sort of specific details and stuff, any anywhere where they can go to obtain more info? Uh, yeah, um, you can email through cam at opencorp.com.au if, need, if people have specific questions, uh, direct you to the right people in my team uh, to get the info, whether it's to gather the type of info that Matt's talking about or to sit down with someone and look at your own personal investment situation. Okay, that sounds really good. Well, gents, thanks for your time today. I always enjoy it, and uh, we'll get you back on again soon. And as I said at the top end of the podcast, it's good to uh, do a deep dive into some of these markets and give some sense towards um, how all these different nuances are changing and shaping uh, this changing face of property in Australia. So any questions at all for Matt and uh, Cam uh, or myself, um, you can email the team here, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. If you're not yet subscribing, you can do so on the website uh, or social media if that's how you like to get your info. Smart Property HQ is where you'll find us. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Bluestone makes investment loans simple with competitive interest rates. Borrow up to 85% of the value of your investment property without paying lender's mortgage insurance and no cap on existing investment portfolio size, plus personal Bluestone support from application to settlement. So don't wait to unlock your future. Bluestone, award-winning home loan solutions. Find out more at bluestone.com.au slash investors. Lending criteria, T's and C's and fees apply. Credit provided by Permanent Custodians Limited Australian Credit Licence 390183.